Hello, you are watching Rock Paper Shotgun and my sort of analysis review thing, we're very technical on this channel, of Compulsion Games' We Happy Few. I'm going to be talking about what worked for me and what didn't. And it's my professional opinion, I'm saying this while adjusting my metaphorical spectacles, that I both like and dislike elements in We Happy Few, some simultaneously and others in relation to the polarizing beta that came before. Which is good, seeing as it's in this weird limbo of success and failure that games are often at their most interesting. Set in a dystopian Britain in 1964, where most of the population are conforming and forgetting a bleak history through a drug named Joy, you play three characters with their own pasts and presents to confront to varying results. This video focuses on the first story character, Arthur, to avoid major spoilers. We Happy Few is just like the old oddball television shows and films it was based on, like The Avengers and The Clockwork Orange, in that it sort of defies a straightforward explanation. It's a lot of things. You spend your time in this game sneaking, leveling up, collecting items, managing survival elements, hitting people with umbrellas, side questing, exploring, adventuring, taking drugs, all within the course of five minutes. It does all this having gone through one of the more shape-shifting early access journeys, where the harder survival push of the original pitch gradually softened into a more story-focused adventure. So where to begin with this hodgepodge of genres? I suppose another comparison wouldn't hurt. The game as it is now has been likened to Bioshock, to which I say, yes, I agree, all the way down to its socio-political undertones and addiction analogies. Only it isn't quite as linear as all that, on account of its randomly generated islands. These are sewn into the fabric between more scripted main quest areas. In practice, We Happy Few has more in common with immersive sims. How? Considering it began life with more of a survival bent, there's a surprising lack of urgency. You're free to explore and decide your approach, which is something I associate with more sandboxy sims. The gentle pace isn't a bad thing here. We Happy Few doesn't fall down as egregiously as, say, Fallout 4, and its total lack of insistence to do anything even remotely related to the main storyline. Any push to take immediate action is entirely in the writing. For example, at one point in Arthur's story, you must track down a certain story-relevant character and make it up to them. A quest like smoothing over an argument doesn't exactly have a strict use-by date on it, so how quickly or reluctantly you go about completing the task doesn't feel out of place, and the same goes for the majority of quests. I do want to quickly note though that other playable characters that are imaginatively conceptualized and wonderfully performed in ways you don't normally see or hear do change up the pace of play and inject a bit of urgency to varying degrees, but I don't want to spoil their twists in this video. They definitely give you extra concerns to worry about, but my general point and feelings still stand. And like an immersive sim, a sizable chunk of the charm and intrigue is delivered through characters and events off the beaten path. But since the areas you explore are procedurally generated, the order and locations of these tasks always takes you by surprise. The right event at the right time can further your appreciation of this world. When I arrived in St. George's Holm, for example, I had to administer a crash syringe to a woman paralyzed in the street by seizures from the joy pill she'd just popped. The syringe cured her immediately, just in time for her family and friends to brandish their weapons and chase her down the street. Of course, she's no longer one of them. A brilliant manifestation of the tensions in that area. If you had no sympathy for wastrels, people unable to take joy for various reasons, often physical and out of their control, this situation could change your mind. But for the handful of serendipitous story beats, there's another that's forgettable or simply didn't work. One example would be the very meta, superb Meat Boy quest, in which you must track down Ed McMillan, an old friend of Arthur's brother, which just didn't want to work. The location of the quest marker would flit about my map, constantly changing location, and when it did settle and I attempted to, you know, complete it, I found myself ransacking a house to no discernible result. No new information gleaned or quest items located until I would bump into the impatient quest giver again somewhere else and the cycle would begin again. At points like these, you long for the guiding hand of a level designer. Let's rewind to that original survival pitch. I hear you wondering why I haven't mentioned survival elements at all yet. Am I brain dead or just stoned on joy? To be honest, I forgot about survival, which is kind of the problem with it. Your survival needs are represented as traditional bars that track your energy, hunger, and thirst, as well as your joy threshold, I'll get to that later. When these are low, you don't die, at least not in normal mode, but they do make you sluggish and easy to tire. These are status debuffs rather than life-threatening health problems, and this is the reason for my memory loss. Debuffs simply didn't need my attention. I just packed my pockets full of currents and fast-traveled every so often to the pump of joy-free water and forgot all about it. 
It's true that I had a love-hate relationship with survival mechanics in the beta. On the one hand, dying of thirst and hunger added some tension into the mix. But since it took center stage, it also wound up controlling the pace of play. And when I say that, I mean it slowed the pace of play, where planning factored into the beta. In We Happy Few Now, there really isn't much of a need. Not immediately at any rate. It's that lack of urgency raising its head again, but with less appealing results. Survival also has an uneasy relationship with the skill trees. Each character has a unique set of skills you purchase with points from completing quests. And where some skills really do make life a little easier in practical ways, others took an axe to the difficulty curve. Once I'd acquired most of the stealth-related skills, by the end of Arthur's playthrough, practically nothing I did raised awareness. I would love to say this power felt earned. There's not enough complex moving parts in the combat or stealth to require simplifying of difficulty. Merely thwacking is broad and bumbling, the range of craftable weapons undermined by all feeling the same in your hands, and stealth is just too basic to manipulate. And even when it does fail, you only have to run out into the countryside until your pursuers get bored of chasing you. Start marrying such broad brush disciplines to better health and stronger fists and it leaves you overpowered. The survival elements are easily the most superfluous parts of the game, the kind of cargo you dump when the early access boat is sinking. But then again, without them, we wouldn't have joy as a roundabout survival mechanic all its own. Far and away, the best system, not to mention narrative mechanic in the game. Much like the earlier survival of the beta, taking and managing joy consumption feels like fighting with the game itself, only this is executed much more seamlessly. For starters, Joy is just a great idea. Narratively, it's the drug that the people of Wellington Wells are hooked on, which handily blocks out all those traumatic memories so you can focus on the happy things, kind of like how I imagine a game show host sees the world. To be off your joy is to be unhappy, and considering what the population have done in the past during the war with Germany, unhappy is unwise. Mechanically, it's, I want to say a joy, but that's a bit on the nose. To explain, there are several places where taking a joy pill, or five, is necessary. For example, in fancy places like Maidenholm, the entire town is rigged to make sure you take the darn stuff. Downer detectors close off streets and buildings. Television sets, spankers and peepers, which do what you would imagine, and other security measures kindly remind you to take joy, or alert bobbies to your presence for a quick bash about the skull. Later on, doctors prowl the streets and literally smell your downer odor. If they find you out, well, it ends with a quick pick-me-up or the whole town descending on you with frying pans and baseball bats. In some areas, you have to be on joy to pass a test or two. I love how these areas expand and evolve to present new ways to make it harder for you to be a downer. So to get around safely is to carefully weigh up when to take joy and when not to. That would be simple enough, but joy consumption comes with so many caveats, you're often left wondering how the townsfolk actually survive at all. For example, unless you're popping two or three pills at once, the effects of joy don't last long. And where you might be able to walk about unnoticed when you're not on the drug, folks will instantly know you're a downer if you go into withdrawal. Again, cue the pitchforks. The only way to equalize your joy meter and restore your brain to a joyless state is to overdose on the drug and force a memory-related come down. And you must do so out of sight, as I mentioned before, or else the townspeople will lynch you. This isn't taking into account alternative routes or approaches. One area kept spraying me with joy every time I completed a task correctly. So I put on my gas mask to avoid any further exposure. Have a short spike handy and you may be able to shut down a downer detector altogether. Or you could find another way around that barrier across the street. As a system, what I'll call joy survival works by requiring you to consistently engage with it in some way, whether it be tactically or tactfully, mostly unlike the hunger, thirst, and sleep meter. I wonder at times if the game is trying to present two worlds of survival, the down and out wastrel territory where it's about day-to-day -day resources, and the respectable society where food and drink is in abundance, but conformity is the challenge. As it is, the latter half is way more effective and engaging to play. Which is a good time to address how well the game uses these dual worlds. Stepping into the happy, happy, joy, joy towns of Wellington Wells feels like stepping into a glossy alien planet where all the rules are a mystery to you, but the level of threat is weirdly high. The game marvelously uses contrast to add layers of complexity to its play and story. The developers talked about perspective and how characters offer new angles on the story. 
but it's also felt in the locations. Walking through the gates into Maidenholm for the first time, on joy because I didn't want to trip the down and detectors, was quite the experience, and in stark contrast to the grey rubble of the garden district. It suddenly made sense why most wastrels seemed so adamant to mimic what had gone on inside those walls. And who wouldn't? The roads are rainbows. And when I first arrived, I rather liked Maidenholm. The constables greeted me on the way in with a tip of their hats. A victory line, albeit set to music from A Clockwork Orange, led me into town. I can't Welcome back remember to the last time someone came through. <laughs> and people were generally friendly and sweet. Then, inevitably, the drug wore off without my noticing, and the streets of Maidenholm were almost as grey as the Garden District, albeit papered in bunting. Still, it was an improvement over scattered piles of bricks and crashed warplanes. Perhaps the best example of how the two worlds of We Happy Few contrast is in safe houses. I hadn't found a safe house when I first crossed the bridge into Maidenholm, and it would take too long to backtrack to the last. As the sun was setting, I realised Bobby's spawned in police boxes to patrol, and I've never felt dawning tension quite like it. All is well and fine when you're on your joy, but if not, how long will it take for people to notice? At least all you had to do to appease wastrels was dress in a shabby suit. While out in the ruins of the Garden District, you find yourself scrounging about the rubble for scraps to craft or eat, attacking or stealing from the wearied wastrels living in their ruined houses. Headboys, vagrant rebels, walk the roads at night instead of bobbies. Safe houses, then, don't really feel like much of a necessity, yet offer pure ease in reference to fast travel. Security in Maidenholm, by contrast, meant that finding a safe house was an immediate need. Better to be safe than dead, or off on holiday, as they say in Wellington Wells. And don't get me wrong, whether the angry mob coming after you are dressed in swanky threads or rags, threat is still alive and well in both worlds. But where sparsely populated old towns offer all sorts of diversions, joyous towns never quite stop threatening you. For example, though I did manage to find a safe house in Maidenholm, when I returned to the streets a few hours later, Uncle Jack spoke at me. <laughs> well, I hope you all had a lovely night's sleep with lovely dreams. It all sucks you into this scary, topsy-turvy reality, not unlike Alice in Wonderland, a place where everyone's a little mad. Except you, of course, relatively speaking. And where wastrels could be compared to the Mad Hatter or March Hare. Folks living on the posh sides of town are more like the homicidal Queen of Hearts, with one eye trained on your neck at all times. Two completely different vibes set in one dystopia. One that you can completely immerse yourself in, thanks to incredible world building. We Happy Few is a big old tangle of ideas, sure, but I like having something to chew on. Whether the game is exploring dual worlds through survival mechanics, or experimenting with scripted and randomized areas in a kind of narrative style so culturally specific to a time and place as to defy explanation, you can't say that We Happy Few isn't going for design broke. It actually reminds me a bit of Beyond Good and Evil, a favorite of mine, and a game that really threw a lot of stuff into the mix to an enjoyable result. We Happy Few is obviously more ambitious by contrast, but is similarly anchored by a few really strong elements. What ties them all together and stops the ingredients from exploding into an incoherent mess is the central idea of joy in the way it carves out the world, narratively ties into the concept of memory and, of course, as a well-designed mechanic. It's arguably the game's strongest concept and winds up grounding we happy few. And it's an experience I enjoyed overall. Enough that for a period of so many days I lost count, I couldn't put it down. I'm talking please, dear God, take out my eyeballs before they can bust levels of video game playage. Following the main questline, I didn't get bored once. But what about you? Are you enjoying We Happy Few? What do you feel about Compulsion Games' deep dive into drug-fueled insanity? Why not let me know in the comments below? If you'd like to see more videos like this, be sure to subscribe and click the notifications bell so you know exactly when we upload. We cover everything and anything PC-related. Why not try some of the videos popping up on the screen now? Hopefully we'll see you here for our next video. Bye for now.